Hey everyone, thanks again for joining up with me tonight for another round of WOW Live, Word on Wednesdays Live. Of course, we're still talking origins tonight. We're still talking creation versus evolution, looking at problems of evolution. Last week's lesson was from Goo to You by Way of the Zoo. Today, I've kind of shortened the title. It's just Goo to You Part 2. It's a continued look at the serious problems that there exist with human evolution, the assumptions, presumptions, which always happens in this whole uh, origins scenario from, from the uh, evolutionists and so forth. Uh, they claim it to be science, but it really cannot operate as science. Last week, we examined the Scopes Monkey Trial of 1925 kind of hit some highlights. We didn't go into great detail. Uh, that event, though, was sponsored by the American Civil Liberties Union, the ACLU. Uh, uh, was a propaganda effort to promote the doctrine of evolution in America. And yes, it is a doctrine. It's a teaching. We are called upon to believe it. Because it won a kind of propaganda war at the time, even though their defendant... John Scopes pled guilty at the suggestion of Clarence Darrow, his, his lawyer, of course. He pled guilty. Uh, well, it really wasn't a suggestion, I guess, if it was coming from someone the likes of Clarence Darrow. to do this, you know. So he did. He pled guilty uh, and got off with a $100 fine that eventually was waived anyway on a technicality. But they did, got what they wanted. They got the propaganda out there about the, the Scopes monkey trial, uh, the, the evolution aspects of it. All of that was put out through that. The, the media was everywhere. It was a highly publicized event. I'm sure newspapers were contacted by the promoters to be sure and cover this because it's going to be very important. And so the Scopes trial has become a milestone in the debate on origins in the United States. At the time... Back in the 1920s, liberal theology was making major encroachments into American seminaries, into the Bible schools, and then into churches. This is how it generally works, right? As the seminaries go, so do the Bible colleges. And as the Bible colleges go, so go the pastors. And as the pastors go, so go the churches. If you get uh, corrupt teaching at the seminary level, it's eventually going to filter its way down to the pew. That's what happens. In the latter half of the 19th century, the century previous to this, Higher criticism of the text of the Bible came out of German seminaries. So Germany started this like in the mid part of the 19th century. And it spread throughout Europe into their seminaries and into their pulpits. And eventually it found its way to the United States. And a lot of churches began to change on some very fundamental doctrines. You can kind of see the steps there. We abandoned Christianity. Uh, we abandon the Bible's infallibility, okay? Uh, we're stepping down onto man not made in God's image. Another guy's further down. He's, he's uh, uh, abandoned the idea of miracles, the virgin birth, and he's stepping away from deity itself. Uh, there's no atonement for sin. Uh, there's no resurrection unto new life. Uh, agnosticism is the step that last guy is leaving where he's not sure what the truth is stepping right into atheism where he's absolutely sure that there is no God all right and, and th this is the kind of thing that was happening in in um, the uh, United States it, this modernism was taking over churches and a reactionist movement to liberal modest modernism formed during the late 19th century, a movement which became known as fundamentalism. The cartoon shown here is from 1922. It, it, as it says, and it's, it's titled, it's the descent of the modernists. It's what they have left, what they are leaving, and what's going to happen to all of us if we aren't careful. It's the slippery slope idea, except it's on stair steps. I, I checked out what Britannica.com had to say about fundamentalism, certainly not a, uh, an exclusively Christian uh, publication. Um, and they said, said this, in the late 19th and early 20th centuries, Christian fundamentalists vigorously opposed theological modernism, which, as the 
quote, higher criticism, end quote, of the Bible involve the attempt to reconcile traditional Christian beliefs with modern science and historiography. Now, they said the word reconcile, which means like we're making peace between the two. Uh, I'm reading compromise. That's the word uh, compromising traditional Christian beliefs with modern science and historiography. Because you know this, the, the scientists and the historiographers, the historians, they are not going to change what they're doing to accommodate Christianity. Christianity is what's going to have to give up whatever it does. So there's always compromise involved. The term fundamentalist, it goes on, says, was coined in 1920 to describe conservative evangelical Protestants who supported the principles expounded in The Fundamentals, A Testimony to the Truth, 1910 to 1915, a series of 12 pamphlets that attacked modernist theories of biblical criticism and reasserted the authority of the Bible. The central theme of the fundamentals was that the Bible is the inerrant word of God. That means it is without error in the original writings. All right, God breathed this into existence. God does not make mistakes. There go the Bible in its, in its originally given form is without error. And I believe that God preserves his word. And so uh, there's, there's, there's that aspect of preservation as well. Associated with this idea was the view that the Bible should be read literally whenever possible and that believers should lead their lives according to the moral precepts it contains, especially the Ten Commandments. Fundamentalists opposed the teaching of the theory of biological evolution in the public schools and supported the temperance movement against the sale and consumption of intoxicating liquor. So they opposed the teaching of the theory of biological evolution. See, the cultural climate, therefore, of the time formed the perfect context for the origins debate that was highlighted by the Scopes trial at Dayton, Tennessee. This was a timed event. All right, There was a, a, a law passed, uh, the, the Butler Act in Tennessee, and they responded, the ACLU responded, this is our chance. We also gave some consideration last week to the interesting story of Nebraska man, Hesperopithecus Harold Cookie Eye. A tooth had been found in northwestern Nebraska by rancher and part-time geologist Harold Cook. Cook sent the tooth to Henry Fairfield Osborne, the president of the American Museum of Natural History in New York. And Henry Fairfield Osborne said it was undoubtedly the tooth of a primitive ape man. An ape man had been found in Nebraska, the very home state of William Jennings Bryan, the one who was so adamantly opposed to the theory of evolution and gave great speeches around the land on that very thing. But instead of an ape man, it turns out the tooth actually belonged to a pig. Pigs don't lay eggs, but uh, these folks really got egg on their face when that uh, came out, that the whole thing had been done. I mean, look at that. They had this really great illustration to show people and everything. I mean, it's really kind of a shame. You know, somebody put a lot of work in that. A lot of uh, imagination went into that drawing, right? A lot of creative work there. It makes sense, folks, but here's a point that's still good to make out loud. Artwork is just that. It's artwork. Right? There's no science in that picture. We know that because there's no such creature as that and, and so forth. No science in this picture at all. It, this is someone guessing what an ape man might have looked like. Sometimes it's a dinosaur that might have looked like or what's something else that uh, bones are found in the ground. This is what it might have looked like. Don't let really clever artistry or really great special effects in a movie be your source for the truth. Wow, this is really the way it was. Jurassic Park, man. That's how it was, man. <laughs> they don't know. <laughs> it's all speculation. And frankly, in this case with, with Nebraska Man, the idea that a pig's tooth could be the basis for some accurate representation of a human-like creature, boy, that's really a stretch, okay? Uh, just bear in mind, these are the kinds of things that happen. There's a whole lot of imagination going on here. 
Please note right here in these pictures, there's nothing of science in these pictures, not in any of them. Okay, you're looking at some faces, faces that were part of a display at the Smithsonian Institution. They're very interesting looking faces. They're great drawings, very expressive and so forth. And, and it's, it's intriguing. They're fascinating to look at. That's sort of the idea. But they're no more than just rank fiction. That's all it is. Nobody posed for these with the possible exception that live human models may have been used in order to capture human expressions and put them on imaginary creatures, even some of the ones that look much more like an ape than, than a human. They, they're putting human expressions on there. I mean, that's no big deal. Disney's been doing that for years, right? Disney's been doing that for years. Here's a famous star in the human ancestors fictional history. You're looking at Lucy, also known as Australopithecus afarensis. I plan on covering more about Lucy in a later pre presentation. That's my plan. But for now, I wanted you to take a good look there at, at, at Lucy without her clothes on, without her skin on, without anything on or in, except her bones. All right. Uh, just look at Lucy's skeleton. I want you to see that. Well, I wanted you to see her skeleton. But here's the problem. You can't. Not even in this picture. You're not seeing her skeleton. Hardly anyone has ever seen her skeleton. This isn't her skeleton. This is a representation of her skeleton. And I don't just mean the picture. I mean the object that's in the case there. All right? That's, that's not a skeleton. That's not skeletal material. Those dark brown pieces that you see there, they represent what was actually found in the dirt. But what you see here, that's not the real bones. Those brown parts are not real bones. They're probably made of the same resin material or whatever it is that the white stuff is made out of. It's just that they're colored and, and tainted and painted accordingly to look old. Because you only have to see the surface. They're probably white on the inside. Okay. Uh, the real bones, uh, the real bones, they're locked away in a vault under the highest security imaginable. They will never be put on display. Someone once tried to gather all the, the, the fossils together. It was, uh, from what I understand reading about it, it was a nightmare trying to get all the different fossil evidence for uh, humans all in one big building and have, peop have uh, different uh, uh, <clears throat> specialists come in and the public certainly wasn't open to the public. Uh, they brought in specialists to try to look, but it was such a, a, a nightmare uh, to try to do it all because everybody is so protective of what they personally have discovered. They own it, see. They have it. Uh, they found it. They have it locked up. They have it put away. They have it sealed so that air can't get to it, water can't get to it, bugs can't get to it, all kinds of things in order to preserve it for as long as they can because their whole career is riding on the greatest discovery they ever made, see. That's, that's the issue. So the white parts that you see here are based solely on imagination. Look at her feet in the picture on the right there. Completely white. That means there are no foot bones. No foot bones for Lucy were ever found. Okay, There were no foot bones in the dirt with everything else. No one knows what her feet look like. The structure that you see representing her feet there, that's holy conjecture. It's pure imagination. It's guesswork. No one knows. It might be based on our feet. Looks kind of like it is. Which is interesting because the, the whole thing for Lucy is she's the first one to ever walk upright. She's an upright ape. Or ape man or ape person or whatever. So we're going to give her human feet. But there's no feet found. They don't know. All right. Look at her hands. Pretty much the same deal. That right hand, if you look at both pictures, pretty much looks white everywhere. I don't see any brown. I think the left hand might have a brown uh, uh, forefinger area. You know, and, and uh, so I don't know. Mostly white, though. And her skull. Not really much to go on there to create things. The, the cheekbones? Uh, conjecture. Eye sockets? Conjecture. Uh, upper lip area and right above her teeth? Just pure conjecture. All right? They don't even have a whole jaw bone. They're speculating on what the distance might be between the two pieces of bone there along the bottom jawline. You know, if you discovered a jigsaw puzzle at a yard sale and that many pieces were missing, you wouldn't want to take it home, even if they were paying you to take it, right? 
I mean, what's the point? It's their trash. But when they found Lucy in the ground, boy, they were excited about all of the evidence they supposedly had for a fossilized human ancestor that walked upright. You know, you know what they say, one man's trash is, wow, another man's, and it's all locked up like a treasure. Back in 1986, I went to the Smithsonian Institution and into the Natural History Museum. If you've ever seen this elephant fella down in D.C., he's not a Republican necessarily. I don't know, he might be, but... Uh, uh, he's in the center hallway and entryway when you come into the big, huge foyer. Um, and uh, they have had the most elaborate evolution exhibit there in 1986. I can remember it well. I went on a Saturday. I was by myself. They, they had it housed in a huge, darkened hall with very effectively arranged lighting. Um, similar effect to what you see in this picture with uh, Adam and Eve there in the middle, I guess. Uh, the first... Uh, uh, Lucy-like uh, parents that we must have had, or whatever. I don't know. Uh, uh, it was so the the, the out layout was similar to what you see here, as far as the lighting and the presentation and everything. The the displays are lighted, but they're uh, lighted in very unique and different ways. Uh, but this is not the way it was in '86. There was different things going on. The amphitheater theatrical ambiance of this created a very dramatic feel. You could almost believe that you had walked into a sacred space, into a holy chapel. And, and in a very real way, I had done that. I mean, this was the history of our origins. These figures around me represented our ancestors. This is the very reason that the bones of our ancient family members are securely stored under lock and key because they're supposedly the predecessors of who we are. It's all about us, see, all about our identity and where we came from. And this room in the Natural History Museum that I was in commanded reverence. The whole place was designed for ancestor worship. One huge display was the focal point of the exhibit. I tried to recreate some aspect of it here with this. I can remember seeing a large rocky outcropping on the left of the display. It kind of took up a whole large wall, I guess maybe 30, 40, maybe 50 feet uh, from end to end. Uh, and, and the ground cover uh, was pretty much sandy on the uh, flooring right there. Um, not much in the way of vegetation or growth represented sand, a few rocks and stones and stuff. Uh, somewhat similar to that, not as hilly. There, now, there was a painted backdrop behind it all, which gave you a feeling of depth. And, of course, there was backlighting and, and that kind of thing to give a, a feeling of depth, darkness in some areas. And, and it looked very much like a desert scene. And standing about 30 feet to the right of the rocky outcropping was one of our imaginary ancestors, very much like what you see here, again with the white and brown, okay? The figure before me was just a skeleton. Again, like Lucy, the brown parts of the skeleton represented the material that had been found, while the lighter parts of the skeleton were filler material. Again, none of it obviously was real bone because it's exposed to the air and all the humidity coming off of sweaty uh, human beings as they're walking through and everything. I don't remember what the figure was even supposed to be. I don't remember its name or anything like that. But the skeleton gave the suggestion of it being an ape man. Again, very similar to what you're seeing here. Uh, and it's a, Presumably he was at home after a hard day of hunting or food gathering or, you know, uh, postal delivery or whatever he did. Um, and there were people milling around throughout the whole display, looking at other displays and everything. But everyone was very quiet. After all, this was a cathedral. It's a place of worship where we're at. Standing next to me, uh, were, uh, <clears throat> looking at this bony ape man, were a, a mother and her teenage son. He looked like maybe he was around 13 or 14 years old. And, and, I, and I heard her saying to him as they're looking at this together, she says, just because you're seeing this here doesn't mean that it's true. And I'm like, my ears are like 
per, even even back in 1986, I was kind of plugged into this stuff, you know, and I'm like, whoa. And then he replied to her, but they have all this evidence. So I took a chance and I explained to him with his mother standing there about the difference in the darker and lighter colored bones like I've been explaining to you. And I wanted him to know they hadn't found a whole skeleton here. They just found parts and pieces. I wanted him to understand that a large part of that skeleton was imaginary. I think there was less brown on the one... Um, Les Brown, wasn't he an, an orchestra director? Anyway, there was less brown on, on the skeleton that I saw than there is on the one pictured here. Uh, a large part of it was imaginary. I didn't say much more than that because I didn't want to be obnoxious or ill-mannered. I don't know what the mother was thinking, but what my intent was to really try to help that poor mother in the face of all of this exhibit in this room, probably costing hundreds of thousands of dollars of taxpayer money. We support this religion. Uh, compulsory support, okay? And with all the, the special effects, all the fancy lighting, the atmosphere geared toward worship, what chance did mom have against all that propaganda, and all that, that effort, and all that uh, technical expertise? How could she possibly convince her son that what he was seeing was a show, it was just a big production, like those faces we saw earlier. Really fancy and intriguing, but not the truth, because no one knows what the truth really is with these bones. I mean, one thing that we have to understand is that the recovered material that comes out of the ground of our supposed primitive ancestors, that material is not used to prove that evolution happened. No, no, see, the faithful, well, they already believe the story, okay? They don't need proof. They don't, they don't think they need any evidence for the story. So whenever they find bones or other relics or whatever, what they do then is try to make it fit into the story that they already believe. It's got to fit there. Now, this is the exact opposite of the way real science works. Doing real science involves repeatedly observing a phenomenon, asking questions about how that phenomenon might be happening, what's contributing to that, what are factors, what isn't a factor, so forth, forming a hypothesis based on that, as best a reasonable guess as you can, describing what is happening, and then devising a means to test the feasibility of your hypothesis, come up with experimentation, in other words, and then repeating it all, going back over it just to be sure. Get all the data you can, and once you're certain you've done all you can, you publish your results for critical examination by your peers in your field. Because they have eyes too, and they have minds, and they have ears, and they have things that they'll see and notice that you possibly missed and things that you need to correct. You should have done this, you overlooked that. In time, your hypothesis you came up with may or may not be the accepted explanation for the phenomenon that you originally observed. That's science. But in the case of evolution, the hypothesis, the narrative of the story of evolution which is completely untestable because no one can go back and correct it or examine it or correct anything that anybody thinks. But So the narrative is accepted as being the truth. This is the truth. A foregone conclusion that's impossible to verify. And then anything discovered is somehow it has to be forced into the narrative. If it can't be fit into the narrative, or worse, if it should actually disprove main points in the narrative, which happens, well, then it has to be ignored because the reality is, well, we just can't explain that yet. So it's shoved off to the side. We're not going to waste time on that. Because time is money, and there is money to be made, and it has to be made, or we can't keep doing this, okay? And sometimes, like Nebraska man, Recovered material is creatively reworked to fit the narrative. We've got a pig tooth, but we'd really like to have an American ape man for the ancestry walls and, 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 and rolls and everything that are being put together. We really think there should be ape men here. And so this tooth 
seems to me to be. Don't you think it's a simian tooth, son? Yes, I do, Dad. Okay, fine. Boom. And then there have been times when the material is actually manufactured and planted on the scene. This painting captures a historic moment in scientific history, evolutionary history. This is a group portrait of the infamous Piltdown Man skull being examined there by Arthur Keith, the guy in the middle. In the back row from the left are F. O. Barlow, G. Elliot Smith, and we'll see a photograph of him a little later, Charles Dawson, we'll talk about him a good bit, and Arthur Smith Woodward next to him, we'll mention him some. In the front row are A. S. Underwood, Arthur Keith with the white jacket on and with the calipers there examining the, the skull, and then W. P. Pygraft, Pycraft, rather, and Ray Ray Lancaster, but Lancaster is L-A-N-K-E-S-T-E-R. British men all. Take notice of the portrait in the background. Kind of hard to see from here, but that's Charles Darwin in the portrait there on the wall. He's the father of all this. He's overlooking the, the work that these uh, younger, uh, uh, now uh, inheritors, uh, descendants of his uh, scientifically and so forth, are handling this evidence that they found. This painting was the work of John Cook, and it was done in 1915. So what's the story of the Piltdown Man, the Piltdown Man's skull? Well, first, here's a look at where Piltdown is in the world. It's the name of a place, a, a, a little village or hamlet in England. You can see London north of Piltdown up there about 40 miles to the north. And France is located, of course, across the English Channel, southeast of Piltdown there. Piltdown is a very small hamlet. It's a seemingly unlikely place for a mystery. But then again, mysteries are, I suppose, destined to happen in unlikely places. That's part of the mystery. My source for much of my information on this Piltdown Man account, as well as a number of uh, other uh, pieces of information, some more information on how this story on human evolution was concocted and presented, uh, is this book here, Bones of Contention, A Creationist Assessment of Human Fossils by Marvin Lubenow. Very good book, very interesting book, a little on the uh, uh, slightly expensive side for books. It's not in the less than $20 range. It's about $30 for the, the, the paperback, but it's really good. Very thick book, lots of information in there. Uh, in the early 1900s, Charles Dawson was a lawyer who served the crown as a solicitor. He resided in Piltdown, and in 1908, a workman at a local gravel pit handed Dawson a portion of a human skull, a piece from the rear of the skull known as the parietal region. Somebody handed me part of a human skull today. My, I probably wouldn't take it, and I would whip out my cell phone and be calling 911. Man, we just found a human skull here. You know, Apparently, that didn't occur to Dawson. Of course, I know he didn't think about a cell phone, but what I'm saying is contacting the authorities didn't seem to be the thing. Because uh, he kept rummaging around in that gravel pit for more stuff, apparently, because in late 1911 he found several more skull pieces in the refuse piles next to the gravel pit. Here you see four sections of a skull uh, at the top, and if you look closely, that fifth piece at the bottom there, right to the right of, uh, of Dawson's picture there, uh, is a jawbone. It has a few teeth in it. <clears throat> Keep that jawbone in mind as it becomes important later in the story. In early 1912, Charles Dawson took the skull fragments he had to the British Museum up in London, and he gave them to Arthur Smith Woodward, pictured on the left there, upper left corner. And in 1907, uh, what had happened, a jaw had been discovered on the European continent in Heidelberg, Germany the so-called Maurer mandible. And that's what you see down at the bottom. Maurer is M-A-U-E-R. 
lot of German folks in this area, probably some named Maurer and so forth. That's that's what the Maurer mandible. All right, that fossil fellow was prop popularly called Heidelberg Man, and Dawson felt now that his find would rival the one found in Heidelberg. He's pretty excited about what he has here. So that's a great idea. Uh, rivalry, though. Does that sound scientific to you? Rivalry? Isn't this a cooperative effort among great minds, uh, free of, ob of, of subjectivity? They're all objective in their, 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 their judgments and, and not in competition with each other. Egos are left at the door, right? Uh, <laughs> oh, well, it, it doesn't sound like it's scientific to be have be rivals, but it does sound a great deal like the way human beings actually conduct ourselves. I mean, think of it this way. Germany had their own primitive human ancestor found in 1907. In fact, in the 1850s, they found Neanderthal bones were found in Germany. So they're like already swinging uh, the bat in a lot of ways to, to get the on the scene with uh, ancestors, right? So in 1908, you know, they, they've got a 1907 Heidelberg man. In 1908, Dawson's handed a piece of a human skull from right in his own hometown. Does it get any better than this? Wow, it really looks like England could now have their own literal piece of human history, right? A literal piece of a human ancestor. I mean, I bet that's what those eight guys sitting around that table were thinking, you know. But that's what they're thinking. And then just down the road a piece from where the great saint of evolutionary doctrine, Charles Darwin, had written and had published his book, which started it all. The Origin of Species by Means of Natural Selection or the Preservation of Favored Races in the Struggle for Life. I wonder if black lives mattered to Charles Darwin. It's the preservation of favored races in the struggle for life. And remember, that's Charles Darwin's portrait on the wall behind the, the, these guys looking over their really important work, you know. So they're, they're, they're paying homage. The artist paid homage to him. You know, you know I'm, I'm betting there probably really wasn't even a portrait of Darwin on the wall. Maybe there was, you know. But, I, you know, it would be no big deal for an artist to throw it in there because... You know, it captures the spirit of the moment, not necessarily the reality, like Nebraska Man. To aid in this really important work, Dawson and Woodward were about to be joined by a French Catholic priest by the name of Pierre Teilhard de, uh, de, de Chardon. I'm not too good with French. I didn't take Pierre. Uh, <laughs> Pierre is French. Uh, Pierre Teilhard de, de Chardon. Telhar, as the D is silent, I remember. Telhar, okay. Te telar, telar. It's an L H thing. I'll, I'll get it right. I'm going to try it again. Pierre Telhar du Chardon. There we go. Pierre Telhar du Chardon. It's even better, right? Marvin Lubinow writes this Studying at nearby Hastings, which is a little village. Uh, to the southeast of of of, uh, of Piltdown, was the 31-year-old French Roman Catholic paleontologist priest Pierre de la de Chardon, destined to become famous for his relationship with both Piltdown Man and Peking Man. Later, he would become known as the formulator of a pantheistic evolutionary theology. What? that was first condemned by the Roman Catholic Church, but is now embraced by many Roman Catholics today. Tillar's theology has come into its own under the banner of the New Age movement. Wow. So it sounds like we now have Satan's man of the hour on the scene at Piltdown. Satan's man of the hour. Why do I say it that way? Well, because it just so happens we have someone here who seems to have a veneer of Christianity. I want you to think of the Antichrist here, who is a replacement Christ. He's not opposed to Christ. He is. But 
he's really meant to replace Christ, to take Christ's place. So we have someone here with a veneer of Christianity. Tillar is a Catholic priest, right? But he's also a paleontologist, meaning he has a connection to that then 100-year-old field of studying fossils. And as becomes obvious, he rejects the Bible's views on origins, in other words, a literal understanding of the book of Genesis. Tillar would not be a fundamentalist, okay? But see, he's also a maverick theologian. He's out there, even for the Vatican. Talar espouses this pantheistic evolutionary theology. Let's take a gander at that once. What's he talking about? Pantheism teaches that everything is divine. Everything. There's no sin in any of that then, see? There's no, no evil per se. Everything is divine. Talar believed that the universe is an evolutionary process itself, and it's ascending toward a state of greater complexity. That's the evolutionary part, see? And a higher state of consciousness, becoming more and more aware of itself. The universe is growing in self-awareness. And we are examples of that on the scene because uh, moving from a mollusk that probably never even knows when its birthday is, or doesn't have a name, uh, moving into intellectual realms where we are very much aware of who we are and that we are there and that we are persons and individuals, I mean, this is so much, uh, this, this idea of his is so much like Satan's own rebellious pronouncement. I will go to a higher state of consciousness. I will be like the Most High God. The idea of ascending to Godhood, that's a central theme in New Age beliefs as well, just as it is in what Satan is striving to do. As an example of the spiritually sloppy superficiality of Talar's ideas, here's one of his well-known quotes. Driven by the forces of love, the fragments of the world seek each other so that the world may come to being. Okay, wow, that can mean like a hundred different things to a thousand different people or a thousand different things to a hundred different people. I put this little sidebar about his theology and everything in my lesson on his views to remind us that this evolutionary doctrine we're studying is a major tactic being used by evil in the spiritual war in which we are engaged. This is a means of trapping souls, capturing them, dragging them off. Remember, this is not about science versus religion. No, this is ultimately a battle between two primary belief systems. That's what's happening here. So, Tillar joins up with Dawson and Woodward. And in June 1912, a series of digs begin, begins at the Piltdown gravel pit. Okay, And they found some more skull fragments. They found an elephant molar. And then they found the lower jaw of Piltdown man. Lubinow says this, The skull of Piltdown Man was quite large and quite modern. The skull cap and everything that they had, they didn't have a whole bunch, but what they had was quite large, quite modern in shape, morphology, looked like a human being, see? However, this lower jaw was very primitive or ape-like. Some doubted the association of the two fossils. Paleoanthropologists said, that what was needed to resolve the strange association was the canine tooth. And the following August, the canine tooth was discovered, quote-unquote, at the feet of Talar as he sat on a gravel refuse pile beside the pit. Wow, that must have been an amazing surprise. How convenient. They needed that tooth for further proof, and it shows up literally right at someone's feet. I wonder how that happened. Folks, the Piltdown Man was a manufactured fraud. It was a hoax. Lubinow goes on to say, One does not have to be an evolutionist to recognize that Piltdown really was a dirty trick. Fraud is found in every area of human activity, including religion. We do not hold the entire evolutionist community responsible for the Piltdown fraud, which was committed by only one or a very few persons. 
What we do hold the evolutionist community responsible for is its continual claim that science is self-correcting when in fact it is not. They should be cleaning house here. Someone has been fraudulent. It should have been caught early. It wasn't. There's, and science is supposed to be a self-correcting kind of system and way of thinking and way of approaching uh, the search for truth. But the truth is, it's not self-correcting. And Piltdown, says Lubinow, demonstrates that it's not. The Piltdown fossils were discovered between 1908 and 1915. It was not until 1953, 38 to 45 years later, that Kenneth Oakley, Joseph Weiner, and Wilfred LaGrosse Clark discovered that Piltdown Man was a fraud. The British Museum then issued a statement to that effect. 1953, from clear back in the 1910s, 1908 to 1915. And he says, that is hardly a case of efficient self-correcting. And he's absolutely right. See, here's the problem. This fraud was undiscovered for nearly 40 years, four decades. If you were 20, you were 60 by the time it was found out. Someone faked the evidence in the beginning, apparently really wanting England to have its own ape man. And so they faked the evidence. I mean, Germany had theirs already, 1907, Heidelberg man, desiring it to the point of lying about it, okay? As Marvin Lubinow says, science claims it is self-correcting, but as we discussed earlier, the scientific method is not followed very often, especially when it comes to the field of fossil studies. The evolutionary story, a fairy tale for grown-ups, has been told again and again and again, and so many simply believe it to be so. Any evidence found is then made to fit into the storyline, if it can be fit at all. And in the case of Piltdown Man, it literally was made to fit the story. The December 1953 newspaper article that you see here on the screen says inside that red box, Physical anthropologists have been viewing Piltdown with skepticism for years. Well, that just begs the question, then why didn't they do something about this? When you read that there is the, what you read there is the evolutionist community trying to save their own face. They just got caught. And so they're, well, we've been doubting that for a long time. They're immediately creating distance between themselves and this horrible mistake. Regardless of what we read in 1953, Piltdown was held to be legitimate by many for many years, and it's easy to prove. Check out this New York Times article from September 29, 1931, a little over 20 years before Piltdown was declared to be a hoax. The headline that has a, a, a London byline beneath it there, this takes place in London, the headline reads, Piltdown Man Marks Dawn of Human Race, Osborne says, contradicting present views. And we read in the first sentence, Professor Henry Fairfield Osborne of New York peered a million years into the past today, like he can see it, you see, and announced a discovery which shatters the prevailing beliefs as to man's distant beginnings. Whew. Wait a minute. Who made this announcement? Does his name sound familiar to you? Henry Fairfield Osborne of New York? <laughs> Why, we talked about him earlier this evening. We talked about him last week. Osborne was the president of the American Museum of Natural History in New York City when he declared that a single tooth heralded the discovery of Hesperopithecus Harold Cookii, Nebraska man, all from the tooth of a pig. That's the expert that we're seeing here. 
You know, it doesn't sound like the president of the American Museum of Natural History in New York was now viewing Piltdown Man with any kind of skepticism here. Just 20 years or so before it was declared to be a hoax. He's not doubting the evidence. He's rolling with it, man. He's on a roll. Osborne believed in evolution. So he believed Piltdown was legit. In the exact same way he believed a pig's tooth belonged to Nebraska man in 1922 nine years before this article. Heidelberg man, Piltdown man, Nebraska man, everybody wanted their own ancient man. Remember the Scopes trial was in 1925 and Piltdown man was still a real deal in everybody's mind then. From the Bryan College website, Bryan College, B-R-Y-A-N College, being named after William Jennings Bryan, the prosecutor in the Scopes trial. I uh, found um, this article about the trial, the Scopes trial, where 12 experts gave testimony at the trial to defend the teaching of evolution in schools. Here's what the article says in part. On day six, Arthur Garfield Hayes was finally permitted to summarize and read verbatim into the record 12 written testimonials of the scientific and biblical experts that the defense had congregated. All right, they assembled their own experts from the fields of science and the Bible for this uh, trial. And the reading took the rest of the morning and part of the afternoon. In order of presentation, statements from the following were inserted in the record, but not as an official part of the trial. And then at this point in the article on the website, it lists the 12 people in the order as was just said here. And then it goes on to say this. The documents ranged from 1 to 18 pages. Each expert gave detailed proofs of evolution in his area of expertise, and then concluded with a statement so similar in its outlook that it could have been composed in the same law office. In other words, everybody was saying the exact same thing when they came to the end. See, fake news uh, was a thing way back then, too. Dr. Charles H. Judd's version of the motif is as follows. In my judgment, it will be quite impossible to carry on the work in most of the departments in the higher institutions of the state of Tennessee without teaching the doctrine of evolution as the fundamental, interesting play on words there, fundamental basis for the understanding of all human institutions. That's the fundamentalism you ought to hold, people. Three scientists cited such proofs of evolution as the Java man, now questionable evidence, and maybe we'll get to him in a later lesson, and the Piltdown man, now exposed as a hoax. So, Piltdown man was brought up by three scientists at the Scopes trial as proof of evolution. Hmm, doesn't sound like any of those guys or anyone else associated with the whole Scopes Evolution Circus and its monkeys in Dayton, Tennessee in 1925. Doesn't sound like any of them had been viewing Piltdown Man with skepticism for years or any such thing. As far as the actual bone evidence for Piltdown Man was concerned, it's possible that the original skull piece that was given to Charles Dawson by that laborer who worked in the Piltdown gravel pit it's possible it was an actual part of a completely human skull. And maybe the other skull fragments found on site there were also legit. I don't know. According to Lubinow, on the, the original piece, radiocarbon dating determined the skull to be anywhere from 500 to 700 years old. What? 500 to 700 years? That doesn't sound like millions of years to me. Well, see, it turns out that the location of the gravel pit had been used as a mass grave during the Great Plague in the 14th century. That's what this uh, art artist woodcut cartoon is, is uh, dealing with, the, the, the uh, lesson of the plague. Death is calling its own and, and bringing more people in to die. The rest of the evidence, animal bones and tools and such, most likely had been planted there by the hoaxer trying to build a case, okay? Uh, those bones had been treated to match the brown color of the original skull fragment, like they all belong to the same time frame, right? The lower jaw turned out to have once belonged to a juvenile female orangutan. 
That's why it looks so small. The spot on the jaw that would have attached to the skull was missing. Convenient, because it actually had been broken off to hide the fact that it actually did not fit the skull. The teeth in the jaw had been filed down to match the teeth of the upper jaw. The canine tooth had also been filed. So who was this hoaxer? Well, some said that it was Dawson, Charles Dawson, the original discoverer of the skull fragment. He's probably the most suggested culprit, or if not the actual hoaxer, uh, people would say that he was still involved somehow in the hoax. Not everyone, though, pointed the finger at Dawson. One writer said that Sir Grafton Elliot Smith did it. He's one of the guys that was in the uh, painting that we saw earlier, the eight men uh, standing around the ape men, I guess. Uh, another one said that a jeweler by the name of Lewis Abbott was the guy who faked all this. Marvin Lubinow, the writer of the book, said he, along with uh, Stephen J. Gould, a, an evolutionist, uh, he believes that they both believe that the Catholic priest paleontologist Pierre, Pierre I can't even say Pierre anymore, Pierre Tellar was uh, the guilty culprit. And then one man suggested that Sir Arthur Conan Doyle, the creator of Sherlock Holmes, was the hoaxer because he lived just a few miles down from the Piltdown pit. And around that time, Doyle was taking some heat because he was believing in some supernatural things. He was part of the spiritist movement in England, which is kind of surprising. Uh, but nonetheless, that's what he was doing. And so he took some criticism from that in the press and from the scientific community for whacking out on him, kind of. And uh, so uh, they said, well, he's just he, he did this to get back at the scientific community, and put up this big fake to just take them down. In 2016, the Royal Society website published a research paper entitled New Genetic and Morphological Evidence Suggest a, Suggests a Single Hoaxer Created Piltdown Man. Answers in Genesis summarizes the conclusions. In a new study, scientists report that evidence strongly points to a single trickster, Charles Dawson the man who introduced the fossil to the scientific community. He's the one, of course, that I have circled there. DNA recovered from the specimen shows the teeth and jaw belong to an orangutan of the species found in Borneo. And the skull material came from two or three medieval humans. That puts them in the time of the Black Plague. Okay? The burial site, okay? Remember? These teeth and bones were cobbled together and altered to give the appearance of great age to create Piltdown Man. The authors of the Piltdown Detective Study also looked inside the bones using CAT scans and X-ray tomography. In the bones, they found gravel ballast, weight, added to the bones, apparently added to make the bones feel heavier and hence more robust and evolutionarily primitive, as well as to give the impression that they had long been long buried. The holes through which the gravel was added were plugged with pebbles and dental putty. The same sort of putty was used to cement the filed off orangutan teeth back into the jawbone. Because the same methodology was used to add forged touches to all the bones in question, researchers conclude the forgery was most likely the work of one man, Charles Dawson. Hmm. Dawson's private collection of antiquities also contained other forgeries. He has earned his place in the Science Hall of Shame. And so Martin Lubinow ends his chapter on Piltdown Man like so. The literature produced on Piltdown was enormous. In other words, all the work that was done on the Piltdown Man skeleton as it, or, or skull as it was believed to be true in those 40 years, he says it was just vast. This was exciting. It was British. Britain was cresting the waves of success and everything still. 
He says it is it, it, it is said that more than 500 doctoral dissertations were written on Piltdown. People earned degrees doing dissertations on the Piltdown skull. The man most deceived was Sir Arthur Keith, one of the greatest anatomists of the 20th century. Keith wrote more on Piltdown than anyone else. His famous work, The Antiquity of Man, centered on Piltdown. Keith put his faith in Piltdown. He was 86 years old when Oakley and Weiner called on him at his home to break the news that the fossil he had trusted in for 40 years was a fraud. That's such a sad story wholly unnecessary. He goes on to say, Keith was a rationalist and a pronounced opponent of the Christian faith. Yet in his autobiography, he tells of attending evangelistic meetings in Edinburgh and Aberdeen, seeing students make a public profession of faith in Jesus Christ and often feeling on the verge of conversion, quote unquote. That's, that's Keith's own words. He rejected the gospel. I got to stop and just read what he says here. Evolution is unproved and unprovable. We believe it only because the only alternative is special creation. And that is unthinkable can't prove evolution, it's unprovable. This is what I've been telling you throughout this whole series. Arthur Keith agrees with me. But they only believe it because it's the only alternative to it is special creation, and that's just simply unthinkable. Unproved and unprovable is better than unthinkable, according to him, I guess. Lubinow says he rejected the gospel because he felt that the Genesis account of creation was just a myth going down those stairs, you see, and that the Bible was merely a human book. It causes profound sadness to know that this great man rejected Jesus Christ, whose resurrection validated everything that he had said and did, and then only to put his faith in what proved to be a phony fossil. The widespread myth, Lubinow says, is that science is self-correcting, And because of this, it is a superior worldview. In reality, science is not adequately self-correcting. And for very practical reasons, cannot be self-correcting in any meaningful way. This is a spiritual battle that we are engaged in, folks. It's it's not something that... uh, uh, that that is science versus religion not at all evolution is a belief system and and it is something that people believe if it's unproved and unprovable it has to be believed he says we believe it only because the only alternative is special creation and that is simply unthinkable why is it unthinkable sir sir arthur why so sad. We have our work cut out for us to reach others. There are people who are giving themselves over to what science says today. It's, this is the, the, the end result of this hundred years of this kind of thinking permeating throughout our culture and what it has done to our young people. They look at something on Jurassic Park, see the, the dinosaurs, and they would believe, oh, that must be the way it is, or was, because it's science now. It's a movie. It's special effects based upon what some people think. A whole lot of imagination and great deal of speculation. Even given almost human-like actions to the dinosaurs themselves in some cases. Incredible. Incredible. This is where we are, though. People have been lied to. This is Satan's doing because he's trying to keep people from getting to know Christ. You know, the one article that uh, uh, 
that I read said uh, about the uh, human origins. Uh, the 1931 article. Let's see if I've got it here. Yeah. Uh, Professor Henry Fairfield Osborne of New York peered a million years into the past today and announced a discovery which shatters the prevailing beliefs as to man's distant beginnings. And I thought when I read that earlier today of Jesus' words, have you not read? that at the beginning, he made them, at the beginning, male and female. That's man's beginnings. Jesus said so. I trust in Jesus, and I hope that you do too. Thank you so much for listening tonight. God bless you folks. We'll talk to you again soon.